Um, we're going to head over to Joe. He's going to give us an update on our phase two rollout in the statewide job fair we're hosting tomorrow. And then we'll get to fill and share for questions. Joe. Thanks, Jessica, and good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us this morning or this afternoon. Uh, would uh, just want to give you out some numbers and statistics um, since the launch of phase two over the weekend. As previously stated, we were excited that we were able to launch the program with under um, our three week window and launch that on the early in the early morning hours of Saturday, the 20th of February. Since we launched phase two, we've paid out more than 254 million in benefits. Um, of that 254 million, we paid 135 claimants that either reopened claims or filed new care continued assistance federal extension uh, benefit programs. Um, I think as previously, previously reported, we do not know the exact number of claimants for phase two for a number of reasons. We don't know who, who will file new PUA claims. It just depends on their individual, individual situations, if they're employed, if they've moved, or it, um, maybe um, they're, they're no longer um, needing the assistance. We also know that um, some of them have returned to work, but also remember that in phase one, if, if someone that was eligible for phase one because they didn't exhaust their benefits prior to uh, December 26th, they could have become phase two in that window if they exhausted those benefits. So again, they would have to reopen their claims under the CAA programs. Uh, we do think that 135,000 claimants falls into what we think um, would be the high number of people um, getting into the system to look at new PUA claims and then open exhausted claims. Uh, of a uh, big note to you all is since we launched MyUI Plus on the 10th of January, uh, we paid out more than $668 million in benefits. And we've, uh, in that $668 million, there have been 248,000 Coloradans who have received a payment. Um, so we do think the system is working as designed. I think we are identifying issues with payment delays uh, as we roll this out. I, I want to caution you, we did get this uh, rolled out phase two expeditiously uh, under our window of three weeks. In that, uh, you know, our vendor uh, would have loved to test the program for many more weeks to make sure that we didn't have any errors in that. But over the weekend, we know there are some claimants that are having issues. Bill will talk a little bit more into detail. But I mentioned last week, there are 12 different paths of individual that could have been receiving unemployment before the pandemic uh, to get to where we are today. And so we need to make sure and we're required through the federal government to make sure that those eligibility requirements are exhaustive and that people are moving along and eligible for the programs that are appropriate um, with these extensions. Moving on to, um, I wanna talk about what we're offering through in partnership with our Colorado Workforce Centers and our local workforce development boards throughout Colorado. Uh, we will have a statewide virtual hiring event tomorrow, um, February 24th. It's from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Uh, to let you know, we have over 150,000 jobs that will be listed in that virtual hiring event. And, and we have um, probably uh, 1,200 people that are pre-registered for their event would love to get the word out so that we could look at those 248,000 people that are unemployment insurance and give them an opportunity or a window in to see what's available throughout Colorado as far as opportunities for them to return to work. So would really like your partnership to get the word out that that virtual hiring event is for people on unemployment insurance as well as other people in Colorado who may be looking for uh, re-entering the workforce. Uh, we have uh, employers from Amazon, Centura Health, and natural grocers to name a few that are on there. We know that in Colorado, uh, we have a critical need in computer and mathematical uh, occupations or jobs, also management jobs. There are over 10,000 jobs listed on our job boards in sales, about 10,000 jobs in food preparation and service related jobs, uh, just under 3,000 3, are there. Um, I want to mention with the job fair tomorrow for our veterans that are looking for work, there is an hour that is exclusively for veterans. That's from 9 a.m. to 10 a.m. And then the job fair is open to the public after 10, 10 a.m. So with that, um, I also want to announce that um, coming later this week, uh, we are going to launch an online dashboard for our unemployment insurance uh, customers. Uh, and it uh, will be on the coloradoui.gov homepage. The dashboard will be updated daily with data points that include the number of claimants paid, the amount of benefits being paid out, the call center workloads and, and uh, attention to that and how people can resolve their issues using coloradoui.gov. And also looking at 
um, some of the, the issues that we're working on, knowing that there's cause that there may be payment delays or integrity hold issues uh, with IDME. So the dashboard will be a way to communicate that we're aware of maybe issues, if you will, while we're flying and building the plane at the same time, uh, rolling out these extensions. But we will hope it will be helpful to people trying to get answers to the questions of why perhaps, of why perhaps their benefits may be stalled and what they can do to uh, remedy that situation. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil, and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Hi, good afternoon, all, and thank you for joining us today. As noted, we rolled out phase two over the weekend. Uh, as uh, anticipated, some individuals have had some difficulty. We've been working with our vendor uh, tirelessly since Saturday to ensure that we're addressing issues as they crop up with individuals trying to receive pay payments. So there were some issues presenting themselves upon deployment. Uh, and uh, some of these fixes for these problems have already been put in place. As an example, Saturday morning, uh, we noticed that around 9,000 pandemic unemployment assistance claimants were not receiving the extension. However, working with our vendor, we were able to put a fix in place by Saturday night to take care of those individuals. We have some other issues that we'll be resolving in the coming days. One fix went in last night, and there are two more scheduled for night. For tonight, sorry, the cumulative number of claimants that are impacted or who cannot currently receive benefits until those fixes go into place is 13,000 individuals. And some of these issues involve missing payments for the week of J uh, December 27th. That fix is supposed to go into place this week. We have issues set with out of date state IDs. That fix will be in place this week. Available pandemic emergency unemployment compensation payments are being denied on some claims. There will be a fix in place this week for that. We also have some ineligible standard unemployment insurance claims still showing as the claim available to individuals so they are not able to reopen their PEUC claim or PUA claim at this point in time. And that is a fix that uh, has been deployed but it may take uh, up to two days for the claim to fully process and readjust for individuals to be on their appropriate claim. Also, another ongoing problem that we know is causing some angst among the claimant community are uh, that forgiven overpayments that we previously had written off in the uh, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Those have been reappearing periodically for individuals. So they will look, they will see the balance on their homepage screen. But if the uh, overpayment was forgiven last year, pops up again, our system will correct itself. It's in an overnight batch process that's ongoing. It may happen more than once until a permanent fix is in place. Right now, this is a temporary solution to, to fix that. But if it was previously uh, forgiven, those claimants don't need to worry. It will be written off again, and, and it will go away once we can clean those up. A couple of other notes for each of you is you may hear from some other individuals who now have holds on their claim. We've discussed these integrity holds in the past. With the increase in claims, of course, there's been a corresponding increase in the number of uh, integrity holds on claims. However, we've initiated and sent an additional 22.8 thousand referrals to IDME to assist those individuals in being able to clear those integrity holds. Uh, other notes for you just quickly is call center data and specifically related to our third party vendor conversion. That call center answered 8,530 calls since phase two go live. They were open over the weekend for us. The average wait time over the weekend was just over 50 minutes. Yesterday was our busiest day and that call center averaged 1.5 hours for the await time. We have heard that there were people who perhaps couldn't get through at times on that call center, perhaps uh, receiving a busy signal. There were uh, approximately 256,000 calls going into that call center. However, that was by 19,000 specific individuals. So some of that would be individuals calling multiple times or who had either been on, didn't want to hold long enough, got off, tried to call in again. So it's possible part of those 19,000 making multiple calls are preventing other people from being able to get in and make those telephone calls. Uh, for individuals, however, who experience problems with drop calls when they are on with conversion, we do have a form on our website now where we would ask them to complete that, provide some basic information so we can try to track down those difficulties at this point in time. With that, I'll hand it back to Jessica for now. You're muted. 
All right, let's open it up for questions. Anyone? Bueller? Our chat box is quiet today. Here we go, Tamara. Unless someone's account is on hold for an integrity hold, do you have any insight into who might not be able to reopen their claim by now? Phil, do you wanna take that one? So again, some of these would be some of the issues that we discussed or that I discussed a little earlier here. There, there are some claims that for some reason are not showing the appropriate claim at this point in time to reopen. Those require those fixes. Um, we've been continuing to work that list as we go along. Uh, other than that, if an individual has zero balance on a claim and they've run through all their money, obviously, Tamara, they wouldn't be able to reopen the claim. But for the most part, most individuals should be able to reopen the claim. We do know that there are other claims where they're not able to open them right now because they're logging in and they're being told that the claim is locked. At this point in time, those individuals also would be getting information so that they can go the way of ID me to try to verify their identity in order to unlock those claims and allow them to reopen them. Liz, I think I can take yours too. Uh, you just talked with a viewer who applied for eight weeks of back pay, but only received three weeks. Any reason why? We have had various claims where for some of those prior weeks, if they had a zero balance on the claim, it has not initially paid out, even though we have put the new benefits on. This is again, another one of those issues that we are working to resolve and hope to have a resolution in place this week to pay those individuals. Blair, I'll answer that one too. When I say this week for most of those fixes, are you meaning by Friday? Most of the fixes are hoping to go in place by uh, February 25th. And Marshall, that's an interesting question. Of the 135,000 that have been paid since Saturday, do we know how many of the remaining universe of 289,000 total are waiting or no longer eligible? That's always a tricky figure, Marshall, when we give you, you those numbers. We know that there were 289,000 individuals who would potentially qualify to reopen the PUA claim based on either having exhausted all benefits. Um, in the other group initially were individuals who had a remaining balance. So remember, even those individuals that had a remaining balance, not everybody that we anticipated came into the system. Cannot always speak to why that might occur. Some of those individuals may be fully employed at this point in time, Marshall. Uh, some of them may have other reasons why they haven't filed at this point. Uh, there would be some, perhaps, as we discussed earlier, calling in or, or logging into the system and noting the locked unemployment claim. So it's, it's a culmination of various different factors. No, no single factor there. Bill, can I just add that that universe did include folks who per potentially still had a valid claim and at some point were nearing exhaustion. So it was a, a much larger universe than simply those who were awaiting phase two, um, most certainly. Yeah, and uh, Gabrielle, I'll see if I can handle this one too. Uh, you've been getting calls from viewers saying CDLE received their call and the ticket has been created to call them back. So this generally means they've contacted Conversion Call Center and it's been weeks and they have not received any callbacks or answers. Uh, remember at this point in time, we are still working to increase the number of staff that are within our own CDLE call center to provide those callbacks. Uh, Gabrielle, we also understand that that's not a good answer that people are waiting weeks or they're being told 21 days to, to get the ticket filled. I wouldn't wanna be waiting that long. I'm sure you don't wanna be waiting that long and, and I can guarantee a claimant doesn't wanna wait that long to get in. So we are continuing to work to adjust our call center internally to hire additional staff and to create that as a little more of a hybrid system. There are certain calls that uh, the conversion call center simply does not have the capability to address and handle that our own internal staff would have far more knowledge and be able to handle. And so we're looking at how can we better spread those calls so those type of calls come into our own call center where we're better able to handle them. Again, it will be a continuing work in progress Gabrielle, so it won't be perfect from the get-go, but we will continue to look to keep adjusting that to better meet our customer needs. Oh, 
Jose asking, uh, have a Spanish interview today. Does the IDME have instructions in Spanish? Or the claimant will need somebody who speaks and reads English to, to complete that process. I wish I could answer that question for you right away, Jose. Um, that one I don't know off the top of my head. Maybe someone else, maybe Daniel or Jessica or Cher has an answer to that one. We'll, we'll follow up offline, Jose. Yep. Uh, Tamara, if someone's claim is locked, do they need to call in or is there an alternative to resolving the unknown issue? Yeah, they, they would go online and fill out that uh, fraud form, the same form we've had people fill out for integrity issues in order to be able to be sent that link for IDME. Blair, I wish I had an answer from DC. So do we have any update from DC on the latest on potential date for another stimulus bill passing? No, I believe the House was in session this week and they were hoping to pass their portion by the end of the week. The last I had heard from the Senate was it was still looking like it may not be until after March 13th, which obviously as we've talked about, that causes problems for individuals who have just come off a severe gap. Uh, if you do the math magically, most of the people who have come off of that severe gap were people who had exhausted all of their benefits prior to December 26th meaning that they were able to go back and start collecting those 11 weeks effective December 27th. If you do the math on 11 weeks, that magically runs out and expires and exhausts here on March 13th. So for those individuals who've been waiting the longest until we were able to roll them out here in phase two, they are most at risk of a gap if Congress doesn't get something accomplished well ahead of that March 13th date. Individuals who were in our phase one rollout are individuals who, depending on how they're filing around March 13th, they may still be able to have some benefits available rolling through to April 10th as there is that wind down period on the current program. But again, if you do the math, individuals who were most in need of benefits this last time will be the ones who would pay a price for Congress's inaction again this go around. Joe, how many people were working in a third party call center today? Uh, I believe we had bumped that up over 500, looking for over 600 there, uh, of which, just to answer another question because I've seen it out there, 140 of the staff that work for the conversion call center are actually uh, residents of the state of Colorado. While I would love to see that be a larger number, that, that's a, a decent number at this point in time. And the ask and the requirement of them is that they continue to scale up, is that they be hiring Colorado residents. And we are hiring over the next series of weeks within our own internal call center. We just brought in 58, I believe it was last week. We're looking to hire another 50 here shortly. And then after that, at least another 35 by the end of April. And Marshall, is there any scenario where the state can provide money for people whose benefits lapse on March 13th to avoid another gap? Unfortunately, we wouldn't have funds available to do that, Marshall, at this point. On the state side for regular state benefits, those benefits are funded out of the pool fund, which actually is a premium that's paid by employers within the state of Colorado. So we don't have the capability to tap into that to, to fill any gap. And yeah. we do not have, unless Joe, Joe will jump in here in a second, we don't have any other capacity for any other money currently available for March 13th. But if Joe knows something different, go ahead, Joe. No, Phil, great answer. And Marshall, great question. And I think, as you all know, um, Governor Polis, with the executive action last fall, did put out any resources that we had identified in the budget, uh, about $163 million to pay um, over 400,000 people, the $375 uh, one-time stimulus in early December, uh, those resources at the state level do not exist anymore. And our trust fund, uh, last I saw, we were about $923 million in borrowing as of yesterday. And so, again, those are premiums that W-2 employers uh, pay into that trust fund and, and do not have the resources or the availability to look at uh, paying um, federally eligible workers um, with federal extension. So um, short of getting the stimulus at the federal level coming to su support these programs, uh, I don't see any action uh, being able to happen just because of the financial situation, the trust fund eligibility issues, as well as the state budget is in at this time. And just a quick correction on that, Joe, we're $823 million in borrowing. Nope. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. 
Ah, so Andy, we can move on to you here. Um, we've heard the County Workforce Center employees have been helpful to some people, uh, but believe that they don't have the same level of count access as they did before Mighty White Plus. Is there any possibility to restore that access? One of the issues we would have is you'd have to train all those county individuals how to look at everything within my UI plus and, and how to adjust issues within them. While the county workforce centers work there and they're helpful and can assist claimants, there's also some funding issues and some funding differences there, Andrew, where it really requires that anything that requires processing or adjudicating or determining entitlement or eligibility to benefits requires our staff to, to conduct that work. Uh, Liz, to Blair's point, can we explain, can I explain how a reprogramming would be needed when, if stimulus bill is passed? It's all going to depend on the nature of that stimulus bill, Liz. If it's a stimulus bill that essentially just extends benefits, in other words, add some additional weeks on, doesn't add any other requirements on the program, that certainly shortens up the gap to reprogram. It's much easier to just put in some extra money on a claim than it is to program in some additional requirements. So. If you keep Congress that simple, you might be able to get some programming done within one, maybe two weeks. Again, I'm speaking for the vendor here though, um, Liz. If there are additional changes to programs, then you're looking at maybe three, four weeks possibly. And again, understand I'm speaking for a vendor who wouldn't have had time to give a level of effort related to that or dependent upon the number of changes that might occur in any bill. But I think the takeaway here is one, the quicker Congress acts, the better. The more they keep it simple, the better. And that's not just for us, that's for every state that has to program uh, these additional extensions into their systems. The easier, the, the more they keep it the same, the more it's easier to add, the more you avoid those gap weeks. Wayne, I don't know that one off the top of my head. So we would have to get some numbers to come back to know how many people would lose benefits on March 13th if there's no new stimulus. And Tamara, I'll take that question since you mentioned me there. Yes, um, we are working right now to get those SCB folks that were not able to file for PUA um, upon the termination of SCB uh, November 28th. Um, we're hoping to get them those pool weeks um, as soon as possible. Have it, trying to throw that into phase two would have delayed our programming and, and we couldn't accept that knowing that uh, so many claimants could still get quite a bit of funds um, had we not deployed that. So that is a coming soon. Um, not sure on timeline just yet though. And no, I'll, I'm going to have to try to get some clarification on your question. Who's eligible to file for PUA, PEUC in the next phase? And do we have an estimate of how many people fall into that category? I asked because um, we had what we thought originally was phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. But if you recall, all of those phase four claimants, in other words, individuals who had bounced around between both systems, the PUA system and the state system, we were able to roll them out in phase two at this point in time. Phase three right now would actually be looking at MEUC, which is that mixed uh, earner unemployment compensation that uh, many states are still having difficulty to program. Uh, if a new extension, I'll reiterate what we said last week. If Congress passes a new extension, then we would look to be doing the work for that new extension first. And if we were in the middle of the MEUC programming, we would end up having to stop on that strictly because based on the universe that we've looked at, we believe that there's about 2,000 individuals who would be able to take advantage of that uh, increase in their weekly benefit amount versus the couple of hundred thousand individuals that we would be able to assist by having programming completed to roll any additional extensions out ahead of time. Liz, that's correct. So if someone's in phase two, but they did not receive all their back pay for those weeks, don't panic at this point in time. We are working on a fix and, and some of those fixes are anticipated to be in by this week. There are some other individuals may take a little longer to fix. Um, understand some of the, the parties that we've had difficulty or have had difficulty this week are initially individuals who would have been in that phase four rollout. So their claims were a little more tricky and they've acted 
uh, a little differently in our system than we had hoped initially. So it, it takes looking for a root cause on there and making changes and adjustments and fixes. Uh, Tamara, to clarify an MEUC, were the MEUC folks allowed back in during phase two? Yes, because they would still be individuals who had either a regular state claim or they were on PEUC. Uh, MEUC individuals will not be somebody who was on PUA. It's really designed for those individuals who had a mixed income between state covered employment and gig employment, but because they were monetarily eligible for state unemployment insurance claim, they were required to file the state unemployment insurance claim and not able to utilize any of those wages or earnings that they had in their gig employment. So the MEUC program allows individuals who can establish during that prior year over $5,000 in net income from their gig employment, the ability to receive an additional $100 per week. But these should all be individuals who have regular state unemployment insurance claims or on PEUC right now. And I think we've gotten to all of them for right now. Well, that is like record time. I just had two things to add that may um, prompt a few more questions. Um, we are planning on holding another uh, virtual UI Town Hall next week, date to be determined. So we'll be sending out an advisory on that in English and Spanish. Um, and as Joe mentioned, we are working on our external um, daily dashboard. Uh, just to flag that the content within the dashboard really is coming from claimants who've uh, reached out to us in a variety of forms and have asked for uh, certain data points, uh, specifically around implementation of federal benefits, um, user tips and tricks for navigating the MyUI Plus system, and again, um, what are some of the issues being identified and what are the plans in place for fixes. Um, so we look forward to releasing that uh, at the end of the week as well. And, you know, I think I'll jump in, share, and mention one other piece, because none of the questions came up today related to employers, and we know that there are employers out there right now that are contacting some of you related to fraudulent claims filed against their accounts or individuals they have not, they have no idea who these uh, individuals are. Again, uh, what we're working on there is there currently is the standard fraud form that they could fill out on the website. It's not perfect for employers right now because there's only one drop down for them that it says I'm an employer filing for, you know, making this report for one of my employees who was the victim of fraud. But we have several employers out there who actually didn't have these individuals ever employed with them. Rather than having those parties respond on the paperwork that's normally sent to them once a claim is filed, the preference is, is to have them end up going online ultimately and on our employer side of our website they'll have the opportunity to fill out a form there to report that a suspected fraud or identity theft claim on, on that format. At that point in time, we will look to be better in some of our communication with parties, not just letting them know we've received that report, but we'll also need to let re, uh, those employers know some of the same things we really need to let claimants know. You've reported the fraud, we moved forward and we've been able to shut down the claim from paying on it. But the way the system is built for regular unemployment insurance claims, you will still receive paperwork re related to that claim. In other words, you may still receive a questionnaire asking you why somebody is no longer working for you. But we want to start to ease the mind for some of those employers out there who continue to fill out those forms. They don't see anything from us. So then it's a fair assumption for them to make that we are paying on those claims when in reality we are not on those unemployment claims. I think to Marshall's question, I think uh, as the governor said, we want to make sure anyone who's eligible for these Continued Assistance Act benefits have access to applying and getting these benefits. So if we get to March 13th, you know, we, we hope we don't have to wait that far to make sure everyone that's eligible gets in the system and can certify and get paid for the weeks starting on December 27th. Uh, but we will make sure they get those dollars. It's not like they will lose those dollars if they can verify that they're eligible for those weeks in that 11 week period. Yeah, right. it's, it's not it's not great, Marshall, but the answer we always give is we, we do everything to make individuals whole, understanding that in that period of time, if they haven't been receiving benefits, making them whole later doesn't necessarily take care of the, some of the damage that's happened to them financially. 
but that money does not disappear. We would make them whole. And I think someone asked for the virtual job fair press release, so we'll get that to you. I think, you know, that ties into, you know, as all of you are concerned, as well as we are with the gap that may happen because of the delay at the federal level and, and the extension of the stimulus and UI benefits. We know they're in that package. We know that we'll be able to do something once that's signed by the president and we get rules and regulations from the Department of Labor. But, you know, this job fair, this virtual job fair is a great way for people who are relying on benefits and know that there may be a gap to start thinking about are there opportunities for me to return to work and receive a full wage rather than a partial wage replacement insurance program. So would really appreciate your, your, your help in getting the message out about this opportunity to look for opportunities for employment in their communities. Um, I responded to Tamara's question, uh, both for employers and victims of identity theft that's resulted in UI fraud. Um, we know it's unsettling to receive a piece of communication after you've reported it. We're still working through the workflows to stop that communication. And they should, um, once they've reported the fraud to us through the form, ignore any subsequent communication. Correct. And yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll jump back in just for one other thing I remembered for employers here. Uh, we did have an automated process within the system, so several employers are also getting documents saying that um, they failed to respond in a timely manner to a request and they've lost their right to protest. We have turned that automated process off. That is something that the system was looking, it didn't see a response in time, and it was automatically generating those forms. So again, we apologize for that, for needlessly um, scaring and, and um, causing some uh, anxiety for the employer community out there. Hey, I think if that's everything, we will sign off and talk to you guys next week.